Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Deidre Willard. Thanks for being on the show, Deidre. Thank you. And Deidre is an editor at Million Acres and studies REITs and crowdfunding as ways that all levels of investors can add diversity and income to their portfolios. At Million Acres, the real estate investing arm of uh, Motley Fool, uh, the team studies a variety of diversification strategies for real estate investors. I know that's something we talk about a lot on the show and because we have lots of passive investors that listen to the show. Uh, Obviously, we work with lots of passive investors, so the operators need to understand that side of the business just as much. Uh, and, And we're always talking about diversity diversifying our portfolio, what that looks like, how different people are doing it. Uh, And we look forward to learning more about Million Acres and how you all are helping investors do this. Uh, Deidre, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Tell me a little about uh, your focus at Million Acres and maybe give us a a little bit about what Million Acres does for investors. And let's try to help investors, uh, you know, think through that. Yeah. So uh, the the main millionacres.com is our free site. So we publish about 15 articles a day on things that would be of interest to all types of real estate investors. So rental properties, trends that are happening, REITs that we're watching, all sorts of things like that. And then we have two premium services as well, one of which is Real Estate Winners, which is recommendations on REITs and real estate-related stocks, and then Mogul, which includes REITs and real estate-related stocks, as well as recommendations on individual CREs that are found on platforms, as well as direct deals. Okay. Well, let's, let's back up a little bit. And for the, for the listener that said, cause I get asked this question often, you know, they say, Whitney, what's the difference in a REIT or syndication or, you know, and, and even terms like REIT and crowdfunding, you know, is that the same or is it different? Well, there's, there's, is a lot to know because even when you talk about REITs, you have equity REITs and then you have mortgage REITs. And then when you break down equity REITs, you have publicly traded REITs that you buy, you know, through, through a brokerage stock market uh, investments, and you also have private REITs. You have non non uh, REITs that are not on the stock market that are publicly open, something like Realty Mogul or Fundrise. So there's just so much variety for for people to really take advantage of. There, there no doubt about that. Uh, and I mean, it's interesting. You talk about a REIT, and you're just like, well, there's these three different kinds. Uh, and you know, I want the listener to get too overwhelmed there. But like, how do they how do they begin to think through which one of the you know the the equity, the debt, or private REIT? You know, which what, what's going to be the best path for most investors that you find, or or why would they choose one or the over the other? I think for most people starting out, a publicly traded equity REIT is going to be the way to go. Uh, those those mortgage REITs tend to be a little bit more volatile, and uh, we really believe in in buy and hold when it comes to investments. And an equity REIT is just a, a better option that way. And the great thing about that is that even within REITs, there's all kinds of diversification, right? So uh, in the past year, not not the best year for REITs given the given uh, the pandemic, but you saw this wide variety of how REITs performed. You had things like data center REITs and those, you know, had a, had a really good year because we were all consuming so much more data. Whereas something like a retail REIT or a hotel hospitality REIT maybe didn't have the best year, but then toward the end of the year, once the vaccine started to get announced, you saw more interest in those kind of what they call reopening REITs. Okay. No, that's interesting. And how do, how do you recommend, I know your all's website has tons of information. How do most people learn though about a publicly traded REIT to ensure this is what they need to add to their portfolio? I think there's just a lot of information out there. And the good thing about a publicly traded REIT is that, you know, they have to do investor calls. They have to do things like, uh, you know, publish a 10K every year and have quarterly earnings calls. So you really get a chance to actually listen to, you know, the CEO and the C-suite talk about the company, what they're looking for in the future. So you have that benefit right now of, of you know, all of that information is out there for you. And of course, you know, we write about different types of REITs every day. Plenty of other uh, sites cover it. There's also uh, NARREIT, the National Association of REIT uh, REITs, and that's a good resource as well. 
So, so some pros for investing in a REIT is the diversification, right? I mean, you're investing in numerous projects. Uh, I mean, what are some of the cons? Uh, I would say some of the cons are you don't have a lot of control, right? So a, a REIT is just going to make its own decisions and invest in what it invests in. And you don't really have a lot of, you don't have any say in that. So you're sort of along for the ride and you never really know what's going to happen next. So that, that would be one of the downsides. And would you say, or how does, um, what would an investor expect as far as the plan of that investment on a typical uh, type of REIT like this, as far as hold period or expected growth or, you know, how do you all project some of those things? It, it, it so much depends on the individual REIT, but generally you want to hold one for, you know, probably at least a few years to go through a couple of, of cycles and really get the benefit and, and the growth out of it, as well as the dividends. And that's another thing is that REITs uh, pay off dividends. That's, that's part of the structure of publicly traded REITs. So and that's one reason that REITs are really great to hold in a retirement account. And, we, and that's something that people should consider as well, is that if you hold them in a retirement account, Account, then you're not. Uh, then it it helps your taxes, and so that's another thing to keep in mind. So, so tax benefits do they pass through to the investor if you're investing through a REIT? Yes, exactly. And you mentioned a minute ago, like they the REIT may publish a ten k every year. Well, what is that? So, uh, with the SEC, they uh, they have to publish this annual report report filed uh, with the SEC. And you can always look at all of those reports. So uh, the SEC makes all of those publicly available. So anytime you're curious about a company, you can look at their at their 10K, their annual report, and all of the numbers are in there, as well as any statements that they've made about uh, projected growth or things like that. What about just some tips on on assessing a REIT? You know, that for this for this passive investor that's never invested in a REIT before, you know, some other things that they should be considering or things they should be looking at to just look at one compared to the other. Well, you want to try as much as possible to, uh, when you're comparing REITs to compare apples to apples. So if you're comparing a data center REIT and a hospitality REIT, that's that's going to be a little bit challenging because they're such different industries. But uh, a couple of things I like to look at, I like to look at uh, how diversified in terms of location their holdings are. So are they all in one city? So you might have a REIT uh, that's mostly based in New York, for example, and uh, last year would have been a really tough year to hold a REIT that is mostly based in something like New York office space. So you want to see what they're holding, where they're holding it. You want to see what their strategy is for, for growth and where their income is coming from, because some most of it is probably going to be coming from rent from the properties that they own, but it could be coming from other businesses as well. So how, um, I guess, how much would, would an investor typically plan to invest in a REIT? Or is there minimums? Is it 5000 Is it 100000 Or are there some that are, that are both? I mean, it, it all depends on the share price. Uh, and I would say that you, you know, you want to diversify a bit. So you want to have, I would say, probably at least a couple thousand to get started. Just that way you can buy maybe a couple of different REITs, maybe start building a little uh, a little portfolio based on some of the trends that you're seeing. I mean, that's one of the great things about investing in REITs. You get to see like, okay, what trends are we noticing that we feel like are going to be long-term trends? Are we seeing movement toward certain areas? For example, one of the things that we've been talking about a lot is movement toward the Sunbelt areas, right? So we're seeing so much migration towards the Sunbelt. So looking maybe at REITs that have multifamily in those areas or, you know, uh, other things like that. So REITs really give you a chance to kind of invest in the trends that you're observing. And I was just thinking through, you know, investing through a REIT and obviously, you know, one con, like we talked about, is just no control uh, and, and and things like that. Uh, it was often, you don't have much control if you're investing passively. Uh, however, I just wonder how much is shared about the operators or is that, is there a way for the investor to see like, okay, these are the operators that, that we're investing through or anything like that? So with a REIT, you'll get to see, usually they will tell you who some of their main tenants are. And that's another thing to look for too. So uh, during the last year, for example, one of the things that I think we all learned is that there's a lot of difference in retail, the difference between malls and uh, essential retail. So the the companies, the REITs that had uh, tenants like 
Walgreens or like Kroger's or things like that tended to do better than ones that were mall reads. So in in their investor materials, uh, usually on their website, you should be able to see both where the, where they're investing as well as what their major tenants are. And that's an important factor as well. When did you, I guess personally, like when did you learn about REITs and how did you feel comfortable about like this way of investing in real estate? I think I started off more investing on the stock market side and I didn't really learn about REITs till, till later. And I think that's partly because if you start investing in stocks, you start looking at the tech stocks and they have these really big swings and you think like, you kind of get on a rocket ship. Most REITs are, they're not a rocket ship. They're, they're, they're a steady, good locomotive. And uh, REITs overperform the, um, the S&P 500 over time, but it takes a long time. So it took me a while to get, invest, to get interested in REITs. I came into real estate the way most people do, you know, like buying a house and looking at it that way. But then um, in my background, I worked with a lot of real estate agents and brokers. I worked at a couple of brokerages. And that's when I learned that a lot of people were doing a bunch of different ways of investing in real estate, investing in commercial, investing in, in uh, you know, rental investment properties and investing in REITs because they were sort of building out a full portfolio that kind of protected them depending on what happened next. No, it's interesting. I just I think it's neat to hear how people learn about something like this. And, and uh, cause I hear, I hear the fear in investors voices often when they learn about even syndication for the first time. It's like, or, you know, or, or REITs or, or whatever, or, you know, it depends on how you're raised and what you've been exposed to. I think mm -hmm. sometimes get your free copy of a guide to passively investing in commercial real estate. Inside, you'll learn the basics of passive income and real estate syndication, what kind of returns you can expect, how to find a sponsor, and how to evaluate the risks. Download your copy in the show notes or visit lifebridgecapital.com forward slash invest better to start your investment journey. Um, but, you know, as far as um, investors that you all work with, uh, are, do you all hear investors talk about maybe uh, REITs versus syndication and maybe how they how they put both of those into their portfolio? Ideally, we want people to feel like they have uh, a really diversified portfolio. And uh, and so we do hear people being interested in syndication. People are always looking for for deals. And part of the reason that we developed uh, Mogul, our, our first premium service, was because people were looking at uh, crowdfunding deals and they weren't really sure about what they were doing at all. You know, it's very, it's very interesting. You go on and you see these things, but you don't really know what you're looking for and you don't really know who to trust. And so that's that's kind of where our 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 services evolved. And I think with syndication, that is, you know, that's sort of the most important thing is learning how to evaluate who, who you're working with. For sure. Yeah. The care, I always say the character of your operator is, is uh, uh, the number one thing that I would be concerned about. Uh, and so, uh, okay. So, you know, thinking through what happened over this past year and, uh, you know, we're just being prepared for any kind of downturn. How do we think through that when we're looking at a REIT? I, you know, it's interesting. A lot of people are saying, like, what is a pandemic proof investment? And, you know, I, I feel like, <laughs> right. I feel like you can't ever invest based on the past. I feel history does repeat, but it never repeats the same way. So I look at things that are kind of always going to, we're always going to need. So housing, for example, we're all, we are in a major housing crisis. We are going to need a lot more housing, both multifamily and individual single family. One of the things I'm looking at uh, a lot and hearing so much about is build to rent is becoming a, for single family becoming a huge thing. So things like that, housing, I mean, I mentioned data centers before, industrial is another thing. Uh, the need for warehouse space is and logistics centers is just huge growing. That's not going away. So you look at the larger trends, especially if you're a buy and hold investor, you think, okay, what's happening? We've got these large populations. What are they doing? What stages are they in life? And where are they going next? So I think that's that's a good way to think about things. You, you don't want to make decisions, I think, based on what's happening in the now. And I feel like last year there was a lot of that. And I think that's partly why we saw some of the volatility in the stock market is that people were making just so many 
decision swings over and over based on information in the current moment versus information that is going to last over the long haul. Uh, do you have any predictions, Adidra, just for the real estate market over the next six to 12 months? We are in such an odd situation right now on the residential side. It's been, I mean, I, I've never seen anything like it. I've been studying real estate for decades and, uh, you know, we've had low inventory that is just putting so much pressure on the market. The good news is, you know, it's been great for the home builders and there's a lot of activity in home building. At some point, this market has to break. And I know that uh, even before the pandemic, people were saying this, we're in this extra innings of this real estate cycle. But at some point, there will be a shift here. And I think that that's something we all need to be prepared for. But I think that there will never be a time in which I don't think we're going to see a slump like we saw, like the great financial crisis. I don't think we're going to see a, a huge foreclosure boom. A lot of people have been talking about that. The numbers don't really support that. And also, I feel like when you look at what happened then, you have so many different players in that space now. You have the iBuyers like Zillow and Redfin and Opendoor, and you have uh, large platforms like Invitation Homes buying rental properties. So you've got so many different things happening that you're not going to see that same cycle again. I meant to ask you earlier uh, and didn't want to forget, what, what's your preferred asset class to invest with uh, through a REIT or, or how, much, how much control do you have over that when you're the investor? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm mostly invested in, in REITs. Uh, I would say that, that, that I am probably, of my entire portfolio, maybe 30% is in, is in real estate and a lot of that is in REITs. Okay. I mean, uh, strictly multifamily, single family, um, is that in industrial or, or how much, how much say or control do you have over that? We don't really have say or control on what the individual REIT invests in, but you have say or control over which sectors you choose. So for me, uh, definitely industrial is, is something that, that I'm pretty, pretty invested in right now. Uh, and, uh, also multifamily, definitely. And, and a little bit of office too, because I don't believe that the current situation that we're in for office is going to be the future. There's so much talk about the hybrid workplace, right? I feel like we haven't really tested that fully yet. And so I wouldn't be surprised to see some shifting back toward people needing more office space. It sounds really weird right now, but I think five years from now, we might be in a very different space on how we think about office. Uh, Deidre, do you have any daily habits that you are disciplined about that have helped you achieve success? Uh, I do wake up and do yoga every day. Uh, I also keep an investing journal, and I think that's really important. One of the things that we talk a lot about at The Motley Fool is taking uh, emotion out of your investing habits. And I think we see so much of that. So I would say, take your time, make 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 lists. I'm a, I'm a big list maker and make pros and cons lists of anything you get invested in. Really think about it. Don't, don't, you know, I would, don't believe the hype. I mean, get in there and really take your time, make your list, make your reasons, you know, keep a good folder of all of those reasons why you invested in something that helps you when things get scary is you can go back and remember why you invested in what you invested in. I think that's great advice. Uh, you know, obviously, taking emotions out of it, that's, that's so crucial, right, uh, in, in an investment uh, like this. But uh, thinking through pros and cons of any investment and writing those things down, I think it's, uh, it's a great tip because when you see them, it helps you to, it's just different, right, after you've written mm -hmm. it out, uh, especially allows you to come back to it again later. Um, uh, it's, yeah, that can be very, very crucial. Um, any, any way that, uh, that you all are finding, or, well, like, or I guess what's the best way you all are finding meeting your all's platform? You mean as far as people getting involved with it? Mm hmm I think what we've learned over the past, uh, I, I would say what we've certainly learned over the past two years is people have a real interest in opportunity zones. And uh, that's something that we are continuing to try to find. It's very tricky, I think, to find the right investment and have it be in, in the right place. And that's, there are a lot of opportunity to zone investments out there because that's a very, it's a very exciting prospect for people to be able to defer their capital gains and then, you know, get the capital gains from in the, in the investment. 
but you also have to make sure that the investment itself checks out. And so that's one of the things that our analysts on Million Acres have been really, really looking at. I mean, they see so many deals, they see dozens of deals, but they only recommend a very, very small amount. So I think that's important for people to understand is, and when they're looking at their own syndication too, is that you may have to look at a lot of deals before you before you find the one that's right. And and part of that is a lot of patience too, and knowing that the right deal is out there. So if it doesn't feel right to you in on on some level, honor that in yourself. If there's something, if if you feel like maybe the developer doesn't have a, a big enough track record, or you're not entirely sure about the place they're investing in, or their investment thesis and the and you know their rate of return feels a little too good to be true, you know, be okay with that. Take a look at that. It's it's always okay to to turn down a deal. It's always okay to wait for the next one. For sure. Patience pays off. No doubt about it. We had, mm-hmm. we turned down two projects last year that came back to us and we closed them with a 10% discount because we first walked away. <laughs> so <laughs> nice. uh, it, you know, it just paid off, right? I mean, it's it, anyway, a great advice. No doubt about it. What's, what's the number one thing that's contributed to your success? Uh, consistency. Just, just staying with something and being able to ride something out when it's when it's difficult. I don't think that it, anybody, I don't believe in, in that anybody really makes consistent money quickly. And in real estate, I think a lot of people are looking for that quick deal. It's like no, the the, the good the good money, unfortunately for for people that are impatient, is is in the waiting. You have to be patient. I love that answer. Have to be patient in the consistency. Uh, yeah, people. Uh, yeah, pe- people don't see all that work that you put in, right? Uh, many years before uh, your your business takes off. But how do you like to give back? Uh, I like to give back. In right now, the biggest thing I'm focused on is affordable housing. Um, I've worked with a couple of different organizations on that. I'm part of uh, Urban Land Institute's Housing Council. So uh, that's really the area that I'm focused in right now and, and figuring out how to support that, whether it's uh, lobbying for, for you know, lobbying for affordable housing or things like that. Those are really the issues that I'm focused on. Awesome. Well, Deidre, a pleasure to meet you and have you on the show. Really just help educate us about REITs and, and how we should think through maybe having a REIT as, as part, as, part of our portfolio to be better diversified. Uh, but tell, tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you and Million Acres. Yeah, so it's millionacres.com. Uh, and I also do a podcast, the Million Acres podcast, where I interview a variety of people. Uh, that's once a week. And uh, I'm on Twitter at Deidre, D-E-I-D-R-E. So I'm pretty easy to find. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.